Welcome to my Chanel. A place that brings interesting and dramatic stories. Hope you have a fun experience. Please listen to the next story. Recently, my wife and I celebrated our sixth wedding anniversary, and we have two amazing boys together. These wonderful kids are from my wife's previous relationship, and over time, we formed a strong bond as a family. Our weekends are full of happiness as we do fun things with boys, like going to the movies and having dinners as a group. Being their stepfather brings me so much joy and we always manage to have a great time together as a loving and unified family. About a year ago, our relationship hit a tough spot when my wife went out for a night with her friends. When she came back, I could tell that something was wrong. Worried. I asked her what was bothering her, but she said it was just tiredness from the night out. Even though I had a feeling there was more to it, I respected her space and didn't push further. Believing her explanation about being tired, I chose not to bring it up again. However, in the following days, I noticed that she was spending a lot of time on her phone, more than usual. Even during dinner, I asked her gently why she was texting so much. She told me she was chatting with her girlfriends about their recent night out and planning another one. While her answer seemed innocent, I couldn't. A lot with her girlfriends because it wasn't out of the ordinary. Looking back, I now realize that she might have been planning something with them that she wanted to keep private from me. Considering her busy job as a consultant at a big company, I didn't mind her sometimes going out with friends to relax and unwind. It seemed like a normal way for her to take a break. And I trusted her to have a good balance between work and personal life. Now my wife is enthusiastically talking about another girl's night out, which will be the second one in less than three weeks. While I understand her need to have fun and spend time with friends, there's a concern among the group she hangs out with. Four of them are single and she's the only one who's married. This situation makes me uneasy because she might have more at stake compared to her single friends. The other women she hangs out with are all single. And that makes me worried about potential risks. I want us to have trust and respect in our relationship, and I don't want to be controlling. The second girl's night happened. And afterward, I talked to her about my concerns in a gentle way. I stress the importance of being careful and making sure that her single friends wouldn't influence her decisions about our marriage without her realizing it. Open communication and understanding are really important and I want to be there for her while also making sure our commitment is protected. She looked confused when I told her about my worries. But she didn't say anything, seeming like she needed guidance. After work, I decided to visit my parents' house. I talked to my my mom about how my wife keeps having these girls' night out gatherings, and I shared my concerns. I told my mom that all the women she hangs out with are single. And it worries me because they don't have the same responsibilities and commitments that my wife does. My mom listened to what I had to say and then told me, I don't think there's anything wrong with girls' night out in general. But I understand why you're worried about her being the only married one in a group of single friends. My dad chimed in and said, if I were in your position, I would speak. while also respecting her need to have fun with her friends. They advised me to communicate my feelings and boundaries effectively so we can find a solution that works for both of us. My dad also pointed out that her going out so much without you is a big issue. Then my mom added that in their 40 years of marriage, she had only gone to three girls' night out events. She made a point that her girlfriends were married too and they always made sure to be home by 11 p.m. After thinking about what my parents said, on my way back home, I realized they were right. It was important to deal with this issue soon to prevent it from getting worse. When I got home, I talked to my wife about it. But she got upset and accused me of trying to control her and not trusting her. I tried to explain that I wasn't trying to control her. I was concerned because I cared about her safety. Despite my explanations, she wouldn't listen and went to bed angry. The next day, 
she left for her girl's night out and didn't come back even after I got home from work. I was surprised because it was already the third time this had happened, and I had no idea. She got home after 2 a.m., but I didn't talk to her right away. Instead, I stayed quiet and acted like I was asleep when she came into the bedroom. As I lay there, I realized I needed to understand why she was putting her outings with friends above spending time with our family. I decided that I should have an honest converse a friend. Of mine and asked if he still had the contact information for the private investigator he had hired before for his company. This was so I could give some background context. My friend had hired the investigator because one of his employees tried to get workman's compensation after an accident at work. The employee said he was too injured to come to work, which made my friend act quickly and get a private investigator. However, it turned out the employee was lying about his injuries. The investigator found out that during the time he was supposed to be recovering, the employee was playing golf and doing flag football. With this proof, the employee had to take back his compensation claim. After getting the investigator's contact details from my friend, I checked if everything was okay. I wasn't sure, so I told my friend about my concerns regarding my wife's recent actions. She had been going to these girls' night out parties a lot, and I was worried she might be involved in things she shouldn't be. My friend asked why I was suspicious of her loyalty. I explained that I had three instances where she went out and came back after midnight smelling like alcohol. Also, when I talked to her about it, she got angry and defensive. Which made me even more worried. In reply, my friend said, Well, it looks like you have good reasons to worry. After that talk, I did something and called the private investigator. We set up a meeting for after work. During our talk, the investigator asked about my needs. I told him to watch my wife when she goes out with her friends to see what she's doing. When I met the investigator, he told me his fee was $100 per hour. I didn't care about the cost. I was focused on finding out what my wife was doing. I gave the investigator her picture and info about her car, job, and hours. He said he'd start watching her the next day. For those three days, I waited nervously for his call, curious about my wife's actions. Finally, he got in touch and we set up a meeting after my work. He showed me some videos he had taken to reveal what he found. The video showed my wife leaving work in different clothes than she wore in the morning. It was clear she changed at work. The investigator followed her and saw her go to a bar. Inside, she joined a group of women who were her friends. They spent about two hours at the bar and then left together. The investigator kept following them to a nearby house, which was around 15 minutes away from the bar. When they reached the house, a man answered the door. My wife and her friends, all dressed in black, went inside with him. The private investigator said that wearing black helps him stay hidden during nighttime surveillance. He went to a window, keeping a little distance, and looked inside. He saw something that confirmed my fears. The girls were dancing closely with some guys, and sadly, my wife was among them. She was in a corner with a man who was acting inappropriately. He was touching her and they were sharing a passionate kiss. After seeing this upsetting proof, the private investigator turned to me and said, I think you now have enough evidence to take the necessary steps. He gave me a flash drive with the videos and mentioned that he would keep a copy just in case. After our meeting, I went back home feeling overwhelmed with emotions. Tears were streaming down my face. It was really hard to accept that my wife, whom I'd been married to for nine years, had been unfaithful and was still doing it. I was torn about whether to show her the videos and confront her directly. For now, I decided not to show them to her. The next day, I woke up early and left for work without saying anything to my wife. While I was on my way to work, she texted me asking why I hadn't talked to her before leaving even though she messaged me. I didn't answer right. On how to handle the situation and protect.
because I knew I couldn't keep living in the same house as my wife. It was tough to think about leaving our home, especially considering my feelings for our boys. But I believed it was necessary given what my wife had done. I felt extremely devastated as if my whole world had turned chaotic. I didn't know how to fix things anymore. Divorce seemed like the only real option. Trying to fix our broken marriage seemed pointless. It was clear that she wanted the freedom of being single, and I decided to let her have it. However, I had to approach this situation smartly, making sure our boys wouldn't be alone while their mother went out with her friends. Being in Massachusetts, I knew that divorce in this state was a no-fault process, which should make the legal side relatively straightforward. However, that night when I got home, my wife and boys were already there. When I walked in, my wife said hi and asked how my day was. And the boys happily greeted me with hey dad. It was a really emotional moment, and I tried to hold back tears to stay composed. As the evening went on, everyone started getting ready for bed. After putting the boys to sleep, my wife came downstairs and invited me to watch a movie together. I said no, explaining that I wasn't in the mood. She understood and said, all right, I'm heading to bed. Later when she was asleep, I used that time to pack my things and prepare to leave. I waited until she was sleeping deeply before quietly leaving the house, since I didn't have any other place to go. I went to my parents' house, even though it was really late. My dad was genuinely worried about how I was doing and asked if I was all right. I wanted to be honest with him. So I sat down with him at the dining table feeling really heavy-hearted. I showed my dad the videos that the private investigator had collected revealing the evidence. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, and his disbelief echoed the pain and shock I had been going through. My mom joined us downstairs, and I decided to show her the evidence too. The revelation left both of my parents without words unable to grasp the sense of betrayal. I gathered the courage to let them know that I had decided to leave and start the process of getting a divorce. While they seemed sad, they didn't try to talk me out of it. After all, my choice was clear because of my wife's unfaithfulness, and I had reached it to point where there was no going back. That night, I stayed at my parents' house to find comfort in their support during this tough time. The next morning, I woke up and sent a text to my boss, explaining that I'd be coming in late due to personal reasons. My boss was understanding and had no problem with it while I managed my work matters. I saw a bunch of texts from my wife showing concern about where I was and why I had left the previous night. Despite all the messages, I didn't reply to any of them. I was still dealing with my emotions and needed space to process everything that had happened taking strong action I looked for a divorce lawyer and started the legal process based on the fact that she had cheated. At the same time, I made the tough choice to move out of the house when I knew she wouldn't be there. I came back later to leave her a note. In the note, I explained that I had started the divorce process and gave her the necessary info. I also told her she could contact me at my parents' house if she needed anything. During this chaotic time, when my work day ended, I went to my parents' house and saw my wife's car in the driveway. When I walked in, I found her at the kitchen table. Tears running down her face. She asked why I had filed for divorce. And I gathered the courage to show her the videos on my phone while I played the evidence. I calmly told her that I didn't deserve to be treated like this and that her actions had shattered the trust between us. After a long and heartfelt talk, we both agreed that divorce was the best option. I told her I didn't want to keep the house since it was a rental property so I suggested she could have it since she could handle the rent alone. The divorce process went smoothly, and the judge gave me 30 days to get my things from the house. I chose not to ask for alimony since I made more money, and child support wasn't needed as the kids were already getting it from their biological dad. We were both 33 years old, and the boys were 7 and 8. It was really sad because I had grown to love those boys deeply, treating them like my own even though I knew I wasn't their biological father. When my job offered me a chance in another state, 
I chose to take it to start a new phase of my life. I switched to my phone number only sharing it with my parents and a few close friends. Starting on this new journey, I've built a whole new life for myself. Almost a year has gone by, and I'm doing really well. I've embraced dating again and emotionally, I'm in a much better place. Moving and starting fresh has turned out to be a positive and transformative experience. My friends have told me that my ex-wife has been asking about me and even tried to connect on social media. However, I have no interest in reconnecting with her or going back to the past. I'm satisfied with the choice I made to move forward in my life, and I encourage anyone in a similar situation to do the same. Although I still have tough moments, I'm learning to handle them one day at a time. Taking each day as it comes is how I'm dealing with the challenges that come up from time to time. Thank you for sticking with the story until the end. And if you enjoyed it, please show support by liking and subscribing to our channel. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. About a month ago, I discovered that both of my kids were the results of affairs my soon-to-be ex-wife had. For some time now, I've had a feeling that neither of them were really mine. Six years back, when my son was born, I was incredibly happy I had married my best friend. We had a child together and everything seemed fantastic, but things changed as he got older. After a couple of years, I began to doubt if he was truly my child. He didn't resemble me. As he continued to grow, I noticed more and more how different he looked from what I would expect my child to look like. I'm not one to be small-minded or overly suspicious, so I didn't let that alone bother me. But it was my unfaithful wife's behavior that really raised my concerns. Whenever she went out, her whereabouts didn't match what she told me. She had big gaps in her schedule that she couldn't explain prevented me from meeting anyone from her workplace. And a club friend of hers accused her of flirting with her back then. The situation worsened as her lies started catching up with her shortly after our son was born. However, I still loved her, foolish as it may sound. Whenever her lies unraveled, she'd assure me of her love for me. She managed to make me believe that even though she was deceitful and manipulative, she wasn't the type of deceitful manipulative person I thought. Last year, she became pregnant again, and a small glimmer of hope clung to me that the child might be mine. Yet when her daughter was born, it was clear she was of mixed race. I refused to sign the birth certificate and the paternity test I insisted on confirmed my long-held suspicions. Neither of them are my children. That day, I initiated divorce proceedings and walked away from the family I had built. Knowing it would be devastating for her son to see me leave. Despite my worries, I did my absolute best to be a good father to him. I cherished him deeply and gave my all to be the dad he deserved. But now when I see him, a sense of revulsion fills me, I'm repulsed by my unfaithful wife, disgusted with myself for not trusting my gut feeling, and sickened by the idea that the past six years of my life were in vain. I've been labeled a monster by several people for leaving my son like this. Since I moved out, my ex has attempted multiple times to manipulate me into returning. She has him call me at odd hours of the night, sobbing, and pleading for his daddy to come back. On the day I left, she paraded him into the room while I was packing, trying to show me the harm I'm causing. Whenever he's mentioned in conversations, whether online or offline, I'm subjected to criticism and humiliation. Even though I'm not the biological father of the boy, I am still his dad. Unfortunately, what I've come to realize now is that most people don't care about my own emotions. My parents are the only ones supporting me through all of this as my, my own siblings criticize me for leaving a child behind, labeling me as a terrible person. My feelings of hurt and betrayal hold no value. All because there's a child involved. I understand it's not his fault. I know that the man he considered his father his whole life just walked away, but why am I expected to toughen up? Why must I pretend that everything is okay and hide my resentment for this whole situation? Why should I ignore my own life and feelings?
I never truly was the boy's father, even though I loved him as one and still do. But if I had to continue playing that role, I would eventually come to despise him and resent him. I'd hate myself for not standing up and taking control of my own life again. He isn't my child. And even though it's not his fault, he's no longer my responsibility. Update. Well, this post really took off. Looks like sharing my personal problems achieved something. Anyhow, I've noticed a few common questions, so I'll just address them here. Her son knows the truth about why I left. I sat down with him and explained that I'm not his father, and that his mother deceived and cheated on me. I made sure he understood that I'm not angry at him, that none of this is his fault, and that I'll still think he's an incredible kid. Some people are suggesting that I never cared for him or was always seeking a way to escape. It's tough to convey feelings in a text post like this. And it's even harder to let intense anger towards your unfaithful wife distort the past six years of your life. However, you're free to believe whatever you want. I have a lawyer and I won't be required to pay child support or alimony. Finally, for those who think I should remain a father figure in her son's life, that's not realistically feasible. I don't hold any hatred towards him. But I've been deceived, manipulated, and taken advantage of by a selfish and deceitful woman who has now entangled her children in her web of lies. He's an innocent victim of her actions, yet it can't alter the tough reality we're facing. I don't hold any grudge against him, it's just really sorrowful to think about how he must feel. However, Whenever I look at him, all I can see is six years of deception I endured. Six years during which I was manipulated and taken advantage of and six long years of accumulating doubts and frustrations caused by a woman who used me. I can't set aside my bitterness to try and be a part of his life, because the life I shared with him was nothing but a false front orchestrated by his mother. This is the tough truth I'm grappling with. And I honestly can't, in good conscience, subject myself, or him to it any longer. Edit 2. I've noticed many armchair lawyers in the comments claiming this post is fake based on what I mentioned earlier. I won't disclose where I live, but I'm currently going through a legal process called disestablishment of paternity. It might not silence the 90% of you who think using Google makes you a lawyer, but at least I made an effort. Edit 3. This will be my final edit before I move on from this little diversion I created. First, I want to express gratitude to everyone for their kind words, both in the comments, DMs, and chats. You've brought some brightness into my day after a while. I wish I could respond to all of you, but my gratitude knows no bounds. Next, I've observed a lot of people heavily criticizing the term I use to describe my soon-to-be ex. I want to clarify that I'm currently in one of the darkest periods of my life. My feelings are consumed by intense anger towards the woman who wrecked my life. Was my choice of words? Inappropriate? Is the term I use to depict her degrading and offensive? Yes. I admit that, but I won't apologize for it. What I'm sharing today is the reality of my current world. It's the uncensored flow of thoughts from an imperfect person. I don't aim to encourage hatred towards women or spread a message of misogyny portraying women as terrible. That's not my intention here. Nor is it the message of this post. I'm Bob, and I'm currently 30 years old. I have red hair and I'm in pretty decent shape. My job is in a factory working on a production line during the second shift. I've been doing this for two years. I don't have a fancy education. I graduated from high school but didn't go to college. I did spend eight years in the army as a heavy equipment operator. I had two tours overseas, one in Iran and one in Afghanistan. I didn't engage in combat, but I faced a lot of gunfire. After my eight years in the service, I got married to my high school sweetheart three years ago. Initially, things were wonderful, but now it's turned into a living nightmare. I discovered that my wife has been having an affair throughout our time together. I've been attending school to become a truck driver. I'm aware that I have PTSD due to my time in the service. And I do see a psychologist for it, 
meeting with them three times a week. One evening, I wasn't feeling well and returned home from work earlier than usual. As I was about to unlock my apartment door, I overheard Rhonda laughing and chatting with some guy. They were making fun of me, saying hurtful things. My immediate impulse was to burst in and confront them aggressively. But I remembered a valuable lesson from my military days never act in haste, especially when angry. I had to walk away and find a way to calm down. I was juggling night shifts at work, attending school during the day, and meeting my, my psychologist three times a week. The next day, I spoke to my psychologist about the situation. I admitted that I had seriously contemplated harming them, but instead, I decided to seek a way to get back at them and make them feel regret, all, all without landing myself in jail. He wanted me to see him every day, but I explained that I couldn't because of school and that because of him, I hadn't dealt with them. I decided to take a week off and find out who this guy was and what to do. I bought three small spy cameras online that could record video and sound activating when there was noise. Update 1 I kept an eye on my apartment to figure out who this guy was. He was coming over every night, which shows how foolish I was. I learned his name was John Rich. In the next two days, I got a new phone and a new phone number. Then I found an apartment in the next town over. I went to my landlords and cancelled my lease for the end of the month. I went to my bank and changed my savings, checking, and credit cards. I cancelled my auto and home insurance and got new insurance for myself at the new address. I contacted the utilities to change my account and to turn off the utilities at my old address by the end of the month. I talked to HR at my job to change my insurance to just cover me. Then I talked to the plant manager. I explained my situation, and he was understanding, sharing that he had experienced something similar he suggested I could be be transferred to a different plant, but it would be a third shift position. I agreed without mentioning that I'd be quitting in two months to start a new job as a truck driver. He inquired if I had a good lawyer yet, to which I replied that finding a lawyer was my next task. He shared his wife's lawyer's name, Mrs. Jenny Kurtz, mentioning that she's a fierce legal advocate. I expressed my gratitude and left. I called the lawyer's office to schedule an appointment for the following day. Later, I went to my friend Pete's house, asked for help with moving, enjoyed a beer, and he said he could arrange a truck and friends to assist. I told him I'd need them by the end of the month and promised to provide beer and pizza for the helpers, which he found agreeable. Update over the past couple of days, I managed to accomplish a lot. Upon returning home, I found Rhonda asleep as usual. I obtained videos of Rhonda and John engaging in intimate activities in my bed, along with conversations where they insulted me. I noticed that John used my personal care products like shower gel, shampoo, mouthwash, and shaving cream. He even went so far as to put my toothbrush in the toilet, which Rhonda found amusing. I was furious and resolved to get back at them. The following afternoon. I informed Rhonda that I had some errands to run. I needed to keep my distance as being around her made me want to physically harm her. I had to act convincingly. I discovered where the jerk John worked. He's a used car salesman. I bought all new personal care items. Shower gel, shampoo, mouthwash, toothbrush, and toothpaste. I also purchased a small gym bag to keep these things in. While in the shower. I urated on my old items as payback. Revenge is satisfying. While observing John, I discovered he had multiple girlfriends. I trailed him and documented his interactions with various women capturing photos of them kissing and hugging the convenience of today's smartphones with their cameras. I have two more weeks to organize everything. Update. I visited the lawyer's office and explained the situation to her. I also gave her a flash drive containing the videos I had of Rhonda and John. Jenny watched some of the footage, feeling disgusted by John's actions with my toothbrush and how they both laughed about it. I informed her that I discovered he was also dating other married women. I had video evidence of him with them.
I contacted the husbands of these women and arranged a meeting at a restaurant in five days. Without disclosing the purpose, I mentioned to Jenny that I might have more clients for her. After leaving the lawyer's office, I resumed tracking John. I learned that he was renting a motel room for his affairs. I bought two more spy cameras disguised myself as a repairman, and persuaded the chambermaid, Kelly, to let me into the room by offering her $500. I explained my intention to her, and she revealed that she had been through a divorce due to her husband's infidelity. Wishing someone had helped her, like I was helping the other husbands I informed her that I'd need to return to remove the camera in a few days, and she agreed without hesitation. I positioned one camera inside aimed at the bed and arranged another outside the window to ensure the videos would be admissible in court. I discovered that one of the women John was involved with was his boss's wife. I made copies of all the videos on flash drives. I visited the doctor to undergo STD testing, and the results were negative. Five days later, on Monday at the restaurant, all the husbands arrived without knowing the purpose of the meeting. My lawyer, Jenny, introduced herself and me. I provided each husband with a flash drive containing videos of their wives engaging in intimate activities with John, along with information about John himself. I informed them that I would be having my wife and John served on the upcoming Friday which was the 30th. I also mentioned that Saturday marked the end of the month. I shared details of my preparations for divorce, so they could consider similar actions. My lawyer, Jenny inquired about my well-being and expressed gratitude for the new clients. All five of the other husbands also decided to have Jenny as their lawyer. Jenny asked what I had been doing regarding John and my toothbrush. I asked if she was genuinely interested in knowing she confirmed, so I proceeded to share. I informed her that I had been mating in the shower gel and shampoo. As for the toothpaste, she preferred not to hear about it and just chuckled. I provided her with new flash drives to assist with the other cases. I got in touch with Kelly, the chambermaid, to arrange the removal of the cameras. I also invited her to go out to dinner on Saturday to which she agreed. I contacted Pete to confirm our plans for Friday afternoon. And he assured me there wouldn't be any issues. I've been avoiding Rhonda lately. We haven't been intimate since I discovered her infidelity. It seems she hasn't even noticed it. I surprised her by arranging an all-day spay appointment for Friday as an apology. And she was genuinely pleasing. She informed Ed John that she'd be occupied on Friday. His reaction wasn't mentioned happy. Update. I requested an additional day off for Friday. On that Friday morning, Rhonda seemed excited as she left for her appointment. I phoned Pete and he arrived with some friends and a truck. Together. We got to work cleaning out my belongings. We managed to pack up all my stuff within two hours. When they went into the bathroom to retrieve some items, I cautioned them not to touch a certain area. Around this time, legal papers were served to Rhonda at the spa, and John was served at his now former job. All the wives were served with legal notices simultaneously. John was found in a beaten up condition at his motel. Rhonda was furious when she returned home and realized I had disappeared. And she also learned about John's infidelity. She had to move back in with her parents. Just as her lawyer believed he had located me at work, I had already begun my new job as a long-haul truck driver. My lawyer, Jenny, had the authority to manage my divorce proceedings on my behalf. Rhonda initially fought against the divorce, but eventually gave up. Six months later, I achieved my freedom. John now walks with a permanent limp and has lost his virility. For a period, it appeared that something new was breaking on him almost every other month as if I could actually feel sorry for him. Yeah. Right. It seems that all the cheating wives ended up getting divorced. One person brought about this outcome for everyone. Update five years after our divorce, I was sitting in a restaurant when someone tapped me on the shoulder. It turned out to be Rhonda, but she appeared to have aged significantly. She inquired if she could join me for a brief conversation and I gestured to the chair inviting her to sit down.
Rhonda's eyes welled up with tears as she apologized sincerely for the pain she had caused me. I was truly surprised by her words. I assured her that she had married me because she wanted to escape from her parents. I asked if she'd like to have a meal with me and she agreed. I called the waitress over and Rhonda placed her order. For the next two hours, we sat and talked. She informed me that she had gone back to school and become a nurse. In turn, I told her that I was still working as a long-haul truck driver, traveling across the country. Interestingly, whenever I stopped by in town, we would meet up and spend nights together in bed. This arrangement had evolved into a friends-with-benefits relationship.